All right, welcome to today's GPU computing talk. I'm gonna talk about a bunch of things today. I'm gonna talk about race conditions, atomics, locks, mutex, and warps. These are very difficult things. Um, they're, yeah, they're, they're very difficult. I never got the hang of these concepts when I was in my systems class in undergrad, and I failed the final project. We were supposed to write an internet instant messaging server using these concepts, and a um, bunch of things went wrong, and it ended up just being this server where only one person could log on at a time, and you couldn't actually send messages. I'd like to think that I've gotten a little bit better since then, but still, these are very difficult concepts, but I'm gonna, and they don't appear very often in GPU computing, but I'm gonna cover them anyway because they almost always appear somewhere in every form of parallel programming. Every parallel programming paradigm by construction allows you to run in situations, into situations where threads are competing to write to the same location. And these are some ways to solve it. So I'm gonna talk about race conditions in general first. I'm gonna talk about how to do things about race conditions. Atomics, locks, and mutex are really brute force ways to fix race conditions. The ideal thing to do is gonna be to rethink your algorithm. Make threads not compete to write to the same location in the first place. Because if you're doing GPU computing, most of the time you're gonna be able to find a way to write programs where threads don't compete. But if you find yourself in that situation, here are some things you can do. In terms of locks, which I'm gonna go over later, there are these things called, they, they will fail sometimes because of how warps work. Warps are not, warps are particular to GPU computing. And I'll, I'll go into a little bit about what those are and why they mess with locks a little bit. They're a hardware thing. Um, they're a, for reasons that I don't know, they were a good idea, but we get into trouble sometimes with them. Anyway, let's go to race conditions. So here's an initial example. So let's have, let's say we have an int pointer x, and we want to increment the value pointed to by x. Here's what happens under the hood. So you read the value x star, which is the value pointed to by x. That's in global memory. You read it, and by read, I mean that you take it and you bring it to a register, either a register or global memory, but it, since it's one integer and you really care about it in this program, usually it's gonna be read to you know, a, a register if it's, if it's high priority. Once it's in the register, you take that value in the register and you add one to it. That value, that new value is still in the register after you incremented it. Then you write that new value back to x star. So you read, change it in the register and write back. So this step that you usually think of as just one step, one simple increment, it's actually three steps in hardware. That's important because what if you want to increment X in two threads? Let's say if you want threads A and B, which are parallel, and they share, they, they share pointers to X star, because x, because x is in global memory. If we want both threads to increment x, then we would intuitively want something like this, where thread a reads the value into register, increments it to make it eight, and then write back to eight back to x star. So we started with seven, by the way. We start with seven, thread a reads seven into the register, adds one to make eight, writes eight back to x star. After that's done, Thread B reads the value eight, because eight was there before, eight's what, eight is the value that thread A wrote previously. So thread B reads eight from X star, increments that to make nine, writes nine back to X star and we're done. That's what we want. That may not happen. We might get something like this. So thread A reads seven, thread B reads seven, thread A increments it to make eight, but thread B has a, 
uh, thread A writes 8 back to x star. Thread B still thinks the value is 7, because while A was writing the value A to global memory, thread B still has the value 7 in the register. So thread B adds 1 to make 8, has the value 8 in the register, writes the number 8 back to x star. That's not what we want. And so these steps, since threads A and B happen in parallel, these steps may be scrambled in a lot of different orders. And we don't have control over that. Normally, you would want to avo avoid these, situation by making, these situations by making x global if threads A and B are in the same block. Well, you could also make x global to share to, to avoid the, this issue if threads A and B are in different blocks. Threads A and B are in different blocks. You could also make x shared. Remember, shared, ver shared memory is shared uh, within each block, but not across blocks. So making x local or, sh or shared and thinking about you know, are these threads in the same block or not may help you solve this problem. But there are other ways to do that, though. In any case, we want to we wanna make sure we're not doing something like this, because these steps can be randomly scrambled, scrambled up. You don't know if you're going to get back 8 or you're going to get back 9. You really don't know. And you have no control over, over the output. So here's an example of a program that demonstrates this kind of race condition. Um, it's online. I'm not going to go through it in too much detail. But let me just say that I have this kernel, which takes a value and increments it, just like before. A sub d is the value of a on the host, on the, sorry, on the device. We have a copy on the host. And I time this kernel where a, a starts from 0. And I run this kernel with 1,000 blocks and 1,000 threads per block on a sub d. And each thread in each block is going to increment this. By the way, um, this is bad practice here, down here. I have, uh, I have 1,000 threads per block. I should actually have a multiple of 32 in here. Um, but in any case, it still works. So I'm running this 1,000 times 1,000 times. And I'm timing it. And I run it. And in 0 0.000148 seconds, the final value of A is 88. Yes, it is pretty low. You're right. It's not supposed to be like that. And it comes out so low for exactly the reason that I explained in the previous slide. Some values are reading, some threads are reading the initial value 0. And it, before it has a chance to write back, a bunch of writes have already been made. So value should be a million. We got 88. So that's a race condition. Formally, a race condition is any computational hazard that happens when a program, the results of the program depend on the timing of uncontrollable events. So the timing of threads, the relative execution order of threads, is one of these uncontrollable events. More specifically, the execution order of blocks. That's probably a more accurate way to think about it. The execution order of blocks is more random than the execution order of threads, because uh, threads are bunched into warps, but we'll get to warps eventually. Anyway, this is almost true. So remember that single instruction multiple data paradigm? We just violated that, because we had multiple threads writing to the same data. All goes back to this SIMD paradigm. We want to respect that. So there are these things, though, if, you, if you ha you're in this situation where you can't respect the SIMD paradigm. Maybe you need multiple threads to increment some value, which you sometimes do. You can fix it with atomic operations and locks. Those are brute force ways to fix race conditions. And I'm going to explain what those are now. Um, mutex stands for mutual exclusion. It's kind of how locks, it's the principle by which locks work. And I'll explain that very, right now. So an atomic operation is an operation that forces parallel threads into a bottleneck. So they execute you know, one at a time. So in our previous code, this kernel that we have, 
we currently have an incremental operator here. We can replace that code with atomic add, which is a built-in function in the CUDA installation for compute capability at least two. Remember, compute capability is kind of like your, your software version. I don't know exactly how that works. I should, but I don't. But you need to make sure you're using compute capability at least two. And you do that with in compilation. But if you do that, you can use atomic add, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's an incremental oper it's It adds one to the value stored um, at the location that this thing points to. So the value pointed to by a sub d is going to get incremented by the value in the second argument. And it's going to do it in such a way that all the threads are going to be forced into a bottleneck. All the threads in the grid, not just in the block. So here's an example. What, what's that? Oh, no. It's, it's going to use a, if it used a register before, it's still going to use a register. Well, what this does is that all the threads are going are to execute sequentially at this step. Threads executed, this, tried to execute this simultaneously before. Down here, they're going to do this incremental operation one at a time. You want to, whenever you need to do atomics, you want to use these atomics as much as possible. It's really tricky to hard code um, atomic operations yourself. I'm going to teach you how to do that. But it's tricky, and it's risky. And I'll tell you why in a few slides. So here's an example of how I fixed that race condition. So same code as before. I still run this kernel a million times, 1,000 times 1,000. But in this kernel up here, I have atomic add. That's the only change I made. And when I execute this code, A equals a million, just like we expect it to. 10 times slower, exactly. It is 10 times slower because you remove your parallelism, right? The point of GPU computing is to, is to do things in parallel, right? So this slowed way down. We don't usually like that, um, and we don't usually want it. That's why your first thing to do when you see this is to step back and rewrite your code to be more parallel. I mean, because we don't want to be in this situation to begin with. Even if I get the correct answer, it's, I mean, why bother with GPU computing anyway? Because, I mean, if it's, if it's, because sequential code is so, is so slow. I mean, the whole point of GPU computing is to avoid the sequential uh, way of thinking. But um, sometimes these, you can have some levels of parallelism and some bottlenecks, and it ends up being worth it. And I'm assuming that. GPU computing is still somehow worth it, even though this bottleneck is something we'll have to live with. So like I said, when you're compiling up here, just before we move on, this arch SM20 makes sure that, well, 2-0. This, this compiler flag makes sure that you're using, you're compiling, assuming compute capability uh, 2.0 or above, I think. And you need to do that if you're using atomic add in your code This in, in this compilation up here. All right, moving on. There are a lot of atomic functions. Here are the, the atomic functions that were there when I last looked. There may be more, but you don't really need that many. Because you're not going to be doing atomics very much. So. Add, subtract, min, max, increment, decrement, exactly what you think they are. Atomic add. Atomic exchange just switches two variables that, that are two values. You know, you give it two pointers, it switches their values, the values pointed to. And or and XOR. XOR is exclusive or. These bottom three are logical operators. Atomic CAS, I will go over. I won't go over the others because it's just, you can read it in the documentation. But atomic CAS I will go over because it's important to how I'm implementing locks. So CAS stands for compare and swap. And here's how it works. So I have a pointer here, called, which I call an address, and I compare and val. Now what I do is I read the value 
pointed to by the address. I'm going to call that old. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to compare old to this compare here. If the value pointed to by address equals compare, I'm going to swap. So the value gets pointed to by address now. Otherwise, you stick with the old value. The address points to old. So again, if the value that, ad that the address points to equals compare, I'm going to take old, replace it with val. Otherwise, I do nothing. It's kind of, you kind of have to stare at it for a while, and then you get it. It's like you swap, but on the condition that what you find at the value pointed to by the address equals this compare thing. Is this syntax clear? You think that this should be different, the double equals, or? Well, there's compare. Yes. OK. The compare, com, well, compare. Well, that's not what this function does. Compare is an int, actually. It, compare itself is not an operator. No, compare it when com, I'm. The comparison is between these two things. So compare doesn't get compared to, to val here. Val can be whatever. Yes, just equals. Yes, is that is that what you were saying? OK. Yeah, the way this function is implemented, it's it could have been implemented by less equal or greater equal, but the developers chose to do double equal here. They thought it was more useful. I don't know. I don't know. Ex whoops. I don't know exactly why, but they. I'm sure they have their reasons. It makes implementing locks pretty. I mean, easier than otherwise, anyway. But yeah, there, there. There could be a, another version. I mean, it would make sense to write another version of atomic CAS, to atomic compare and swap. Where this comparison was, you know, less equal, or the comparison was greater equal. That would be nice. That would actually be much more sophisticated if we, if we could pass this a comparison function. That would require a level of abstraction that's greater than pure C. But this has, CUDA has C++ capabilities too, which I'm actually going to use later in this talk. Um, so I think that might be possible. If you pass it in a string, and then it parses the string, Come again? It would be slower. That's the that's the trade-off. You need these things to be really fast, especially atomics because they get computed sequentially every single time. It's more important to make these fast than other built-in CUDA C things. We good? It's important to understand this function, or at least be able to just look at it and re-understand it. Um, otherwise, locks aren't going to make sense. In either case, whether old equals compare or old does not equal compare, I'm going to return old from this function. That's important. That's important to how locks are implemented uh, in the book by Sanders, which I'm using. 
It's important to our implementation of locks. So those are built on atomics. An atomic compare and swap is a useful example. But suppose you wanted to do, you wanted to have atomic code that wasn't limited to these specific built-in atomic functions here. What if you want to write your own code and enforce a bottleneck in that code and you can't write it just with these things? That's what locks are for. A lock is a mechanism in any kind of parallel computing that forces an entire segment of code to be executed atomically. Um, I know, Jared, you said you knew about POSIX threads, right? You've heard of, you must have heard of you know, locks and mutexes and things like that. Yeah. I, yeah, it is the name of the game. I never got the hang of those. Either it was that class is too rushed or I felt too rushed or, or something. But locks, I mean, it's, it's basically the same thing in, in CUDA C, except, you, I mean, you have to implement it yourself and it doesn't work all the time in the right situations. I'll, I'll tell you more about this. Anyway, so mutex is an idea. So lock is a mechanism, mutex is an idea. It stands for mutual exclusion, and it's the principle behind locks. So while a thread is running code inside a lock, it prevents all the threads outside the lock from, from running that same code. It's like, it's like I have a door here, and I'm one of a bunch of threads that are competing to open that door, to get inside that door, and we're fighting, we're fighting to get inside the door. It's like, I don't know. What you see sometimes, you know, hear about crazy shoppers crowding outside a, I don't know, a mall at the opening or something, or or ticket off a, tickets, ticket offices for a, for a big concert or something. People crowding outside uh, the door trying to get in. Could be that President Obama comes to campus and a whole bunch of students crowd the entranceways and try to get in and fight for entrance inside this door, and then one of them gets to the door. And they open the door, and they shut everybody else out. That's kind of what this is like. That's, that's what a thread does. So a thread is kind of a student in this situation, and they lock the lock by locking the door. And then the student runs and gets a spot right in front of the president's podium, right? So he's already there. And then he presses a, bu a button on the podium that unlocks the door for the next person. And that's kind of how locks work, right? So the next person, the next thread, locks the door behind them, goes to that same place, pushes a button, opens the, opens the door for the next thread when he's done and set and, you know, he's got his lawn chair out or something, ready to, ready to wait for the president to speak. So that's, that's what's going on here. That's, that's how locks work. And in code, this is what it looks like. So I have this kernel, and inside my kernel, I'm going to create a lock. Capital L lock is a data type that I'm going to create. And my lock is the object. Lock, by the way, is a class. So um, how many of you have had have a C++ background? Jared, Zeb, you guys too? No C++? So um, have you, so class, a class in C++, I mean, there are classes in a whole bunch of other languages. Class in C++ is, is a fancy struct. It's a struct with member functions. Um, and I use the dot operator for, to reference you know, functions within, within the object, just like I do uh, variables inside the function. So that's what, whoops. So I declare the lock, and I have some constructor that initializes it, and I have some parallel code. I lock the lock, and I do some sequential code inside this bit here, threads are executing sequentially, not simultaneously. Here they're crowding outside, waiting to get to the, the Obama's podium. Here, that's sequential code. Then the threads go to unlock the lock once they've done their sequential code, once they've gotten their spot uh, next to as close to the podium as they can. They unlock the lock. And then some more parallel code ensues afterwards, some unlocked code. So that's, that's generally how I would want to use locks in my kernels. 
And here's the concept. So we have thread A and thread B on a timeline here. Time goes this way. And so thread, if thread A gets there first, thread B gets there second, while thread A is doing some atomic operation, thread A is waiting for thread B to unlock the lock. In this black region, thread B does nothing. Then thread A unlocks it, and thread B does that same set of sequential code, reserving the lock so no other threads can access it. Meanwhile, thread A is, is beyond that doing its parallel code. This is almost true. I'll come back to it later. Uh, warps make it this a bit different for many threads in the same block. I know this text is kind of small. I, until recently, I didn't really know how to, how to um, make good figures like this, but in the slides you can, you can read them when you download them, if you choose to. So that's sequential, that's conceptually what's going on. Now let's look into how I actually implement the locks. So here's, here's the code to implement the struct lock, which is actually a class. Um, you, can, you could have written it as a class because CUDA understands C++ as well as C. But I'm calling it a struct, and I'm, I'm, doing, I'm making it have some member functions. So first thing to note, we've got our constructor here. And we're setting our initial sum state to 0. And there's this member variable. Actually, first, there's, sorry, before we get to the constructor, it has the only, the only member variable it needs is this int pointer mutex. Do we mutually exclude or not? So mutex is 0, saying we don't exclude other threads. Mutex 1 means it excludes other threads. So mutex is, is the mutex points to 1 if this lock is locked. Mutex points to 0 if there is no exclusion and the lock is unlocked. And that's how this works. So um, the constructor just takes the value 0 and initializes mutex to that. And mutex will be stored on the device. And this tilde lock is our deconstructor. I think that's what it's called. I know constructor is called constructor. A constructor initializes all the values in the class. Um, is this a decon Would you call this a deconstructor, C++? Yeah? OK, great. And all it does is it frees the mutex, because that's our only member variable. It's a tilde lock, by the way. If you can't see this tilde right here. And then we have a couple of device functions, which is really the meat of this code. So the lock function. Remember what the, where the lock function is. So the thread calls lock here to lock the lock, and unlock to unlock the lock. And here's what those functions look like. Here's lock, and it's just while atomic compare and swap not equals 0. Now what this is doing is the following. So imagine I'm a thread, and the lock, I'm going to, I'm going in that in that kernel, and I reach an open lock. So a lock that is unlocked. I'm going to go into this while loop. I'm going to call atomic CAS. Since the lock is unlocked, mutex points to value zero. Zero gets compared to zero. This is this is our compare variable here. So 0 equals 0? I ask that. The answer is yes. So I change the value pointed to by mutex to 1. 1 is my, so, so since this comparison evaluated to true, 1 gets stored here. So the value at mutex changed from 0 to 1. That locks the lock. Right? So the lock is now locked. And I return, remember in atomic CAS, I return the old value, right? The old value is 0. 0 not equals 0. So I exit the, so 0 not equals 0 evaluates to false, right? So I exit the while loop. And when I exit the while loop, I am free to execute the code inside here. So now I'm, 
running past the ticket office to Obama's podium. If I'm a thread that got stuck outside the door, here's what happens to me. I call a com atomic CAS, mutex points to the value 1. I compare 1 to 0. 1 does not equal 0. So this comparison evaluates to false. And the value pointed to by mutex doesn't change. It stays 1. And I return the old value, which is 1. 1 does not equal 0 evaluates to true. And what the statement inside this while loop evaluates to true. And so I'm stuck inside this while loop. These threads are idling inside this while loop. So I'm idling in this while loop outside the door. They're, 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 they're cranking, really. They're, they're not actually idled. Sorry. Yeah, I, I shouldn't have said the word idle. But they're, this is really inefficient because, yes, they are busy. So the, the scheduler and the processors won't really know to back off of this operation and say, you know, this isn't actually very productive. I'm going to focus most of my processor time on other things. I don't actually tell it to do that in here. It's just cranking on that while loop. So it's going to get a lot of processor attention. Does the job not very efficiently, which is why I would say use the built-in atomics as much as possible. They, they presumably are implemented more intelligently than this. This does work, though. You don't want to have very many threads per block, though, if you use this. That, and this is one of the reasons. But anyway, so if I'm a thread and I'm locked out, I'm stuck inside this while loop. Meanwhile, that first thread that's running to Obama's podium eventually reaches this unlock function. What this unlock function does is simply assigns the value 0 to my mutex. That's atomic exchange. Um, I previously said that, that there are two pointers as arguments here. That was a lie. I'm, I'm sorry. My mistake. What it actually does is it exchanges the value inside here with the, and pointed to by mutex with this value in the second argument. So it just says, you know, zero now, mutex now points to the value 0. Since mutex now points to the value 0 instead of 1, that thread, those, one of the threads that was previously inside this while loop gets released. And the other thread gets, and some other thread gets locked, some, the, all the other threads get locked out. Now when this lock is unlocked, only one thread is going to relock the lock. Because this atomic CAS is atomic. We don't want two threads relocking the lock at the same time. Right? So that's why atomic compare and swap is very, very important. We want to use this built-in atomic here instead of your own compare and swap that you write. Yes? Yes, it is busy. The pulling? I don't know what you quite mean by pulling. Yeah. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if there's a less busy way to do this with, without that while loop. I'm, yeah, I'm honestly, I should know, but I'm not sure. That would be ideal. If it and if it worked at the level of signals, then that would be that would be nice, wouldn't it? Um, do do POSIX threads use signals in terms in the operating system sense? Okay. Fair enough. Yeah, but if if the unlock function could somehow send a message to all the threads inside here, and all the threads inside here were idling for real, then this would be much more efficient. 
This is sort of the most naive way to implement a lock. A better way may be out there, but there's really not much written in, in terms of this stuff for the GPU that I've seen so far, that I saw when I last looked at this stuff. In the past year or so, there may have been more, um, more happening. I just haven't seen it. You would. This is, a des this is your last resort anyway. It's still very much worth understanding, though. This is sort of the pain that you would need to be you need to subject yourself to if you couldn't avoid a situation like this. Deadlock, yes. 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 Right. Yes. You, you took my, the last words of my lecture right out of my mouth. The, the deadlock, deadlock does happen. And I will explain why a little later. But yes, deadlock is a problem with this implementation of locks. Turns out it can be avoided by, by uh, executing this with one thread per block. That takes care of the problem. Or, or just making one thread per block have any means of accessing this lock to begin with. Um, that'll fix it. Ready to move on? Yeah? All right. So um, this is just for the slides. This is in pseudocode to tell you what's actually happening here at this lock function. I'm not going to go over it. I just explained a lot of it. So let's just let's um, do an example where we run some kernel that counts the number of blocks that we spawned it with. We, this is a very impractical task, I admit. For a more practical task, you can see code that's online that uses an atomics and locks to implement the dot product. Because we, we did some calculations on the CPU that could actually be all done on the GPU. We use atomics for that. There's a version with locks. There's a version with built-in atomics. You can find it online. But let's stick with the impractical task because it's, because it's easier to explain and understand in the 10 minutes that are left. So here's our first kernel. So it uses no locks, no correction for atomic operations. And it counts the number of blocks we have. Because if n blocks turns out to be, it starts off at 0, we're going to go through this kernel. And the zero with thread in each block is going to increment the block index, or the block counter. And so we're counting the number of blocks because we have exactly one thread per block doing this. I should have been cooler and, and written star n blocks plus plus instead of n blocks equals n blocks plus one. My second kernel is block counter 1. There is a block counter 2. We'll focus on block counter 1 for now. Inside this if condition, we're going to call this atomically with a lock. So we're going to wrap a, lo a lock around it. I know we could, I could use atomic add or atomic increment to do this. But for the sake of demonstrating locks, we can do this. So I lock it, and then I unlock it. Um, why don't I have this on the outside? This unlock after the if, and this lock before the if. Actually, I'll get to that later. I just want you to start thinking about it now. Because it's kind of confusing why, why you know, having this lock outside is a bad idea. But just think about that. The locks. The lock is inside the, the if statement for a reason. It turns out you only want the zero with thread to be able to access the lock to begin with. So only thread zero can get in here where we're locking the lock. If I have the lock outside here, then all the threads would be able to access the lock 
and then they'd go into the if statement. Turns out to be a bad idea. Yes. Yes, that, that's that's very important. There is only there is as, is exactly one thread per block with thread id x dot x equals zero. Because I don't have multiple threads in the y direction or z direction in this case. All right, moving on. So I have these two kernels. My main function is simply, it's it looks like a lot that's there. All I'm doing is calling a lock. Um, I'm copying a bunch of things to the ho to the device. I'm timing this could event create and could event record stuff. All this stuff is timing my kernel. And I'm going to I'm going to call block counter unlocked. And then I'm going to do the same. And I'm going to report how many counted. I'm going to do the same thing for block counter one. I just time it, I call it. I have to pass in the lock, by the way, because the lock has to be in global memory. And the number of blocks so far. I time it, and I print out the result for that. And this is block counter.cu. It's available for download online. I compile it. Since I'm using a lock, and a lock uses atomic compare and swap, which is a built-in atomic, I have to have this arch SM20 here for my compile flag. I run this, this program, and I see that when I call 512 blocks, 1,024 threads per block, the unlocked code counted 47 blocks, much lower than the actual number of blocks, which is 512, and it took about 0.06 milliseconds to do. Block counter 1 counted 512 blocks, which is the correct answer, but took an order of magnitude longer to do because of this bottleneck. That's the trade-off. You want the right answer? You're not going to, you know, you want it done quick or you want it done right? That's the, that's the question you got to ask yourself here. So that works. That just demonstrates the functionality. It's the simplest example I can think of. Um, like I said, code is available online. Last example here, I guess. Here is block counter 2. The lock is outside the if statement. So all the threads in each block are going to attempt to access the lock here. Yes. The things that are inside the lock no, are no, no, I mean, the, whole the whole process. Yeah. So the things inside, but okay, sure, yeah, sure, sure. So the. Cur So locks, what they do is they cut out sections of the kernel that you want to be sequential. And the rest of the kernel is in parallel. So yeah, if we had code before here, after here, then it'd be in parallel. Great. OK. Glad, glad we cleared that up. So turns out this is a bad idea. I said it pauses indefinitely with this kernel. What I mean is it deadlocks, like you said. This, if I, if I run block counter 2, deadlock. And the reason is warps. So warps, are, a warp is a group of 32 threads in the same block that execute in lockstep. So all, this is why you want the number of threads per block in your kernels to be a multiple 32. It's because this works out nicely. You'll actually get more threads. Otherwise, you'll get more threads than you bargained for, because people, uh, the, the, um, I believe CUDA forces the number of threads per block to be multiples of, of 32 anyway, so you'll get more threads than, than, than you might want. Um, I think that's what I remember reading. I should probably check back on that. But in any case, you want good practice, always spawn threads in 
multiples of 32 because they're partitioned into warps, and warps execute in lockstep. And what this means is they always synchronize after every single little operation. They synchronize. You can think of that. You can think of um, threads and warps as threads for which a sync threads is called as often as possible, but that sync threads only applies with inside that warp. So this is actually almost true, but not not quite true. Because sync threads synchronizes all threads in the block. With warps, all all threads inside the warp are synchronized frequently. So here's, here's a schematic of what happens, or sort of a timeline of what happens with threads in the same warp. So we have step one, thread A waits for thread B. And here we have step two, and maybe thread B is slower, and it waits for, no, so maybe, maybe thread A is slower, and thread B waits for thread A, and then, and so on. And every single little operation happens like that. So here are threads in different, war in different warps. Warps sort of limit execution speed because the whole warp is only as, as fast as the slowest thread. If we have threads in different warps, sort of thread, thread A can get things done quicker than thread B in this case. Okay, threads in. So this is what happens in locks when I have two threads in the same warp trying to execute, trying to access the same lock. So what happens is thread, let's say thread A is faster in the parallel code. It gets the lock and locks it. Thread B then gets stuck at the lock, at, at the lock. It's banging on the door trying to get in. It's banging angrily in that while loop, scurrying away furiously. And that, meanwhile, thread A does its atomic operations Actually, no. This diagram is for threads in different blocks. Yeah, threads in different blocks. I'm sorry. I meant to say threads in different blocks, this is what happens. So, so if the threads are in different warps, then thread A can move on and do its atomic operations. Thread B waits all this time until the lock is unlocked. Then they both move on. Thread B does the thing inside the lock. Thread A does the thing after the lock. Thread A can, can do this atomic operations stuff inside the lock because these two threads are in different warps. If the threads are in the same warp, on the other hand, here's what happens. Deadlock. Thread A gets there first, locks the lock. Thread B gets stuck at the lock. And by the definition of a lock, by the construction of a lock, thread B waits for thread A to unlock it. So thread B is waiting at that lock. It's waiting at that door. And it's waiting for thread A to get done with the stuff inside the lock. But thread A doesn't even get to the stuff inside the lock because these two threads are in the same warp. So that means since thread B doesn't exit the while loop, thread A can't exit the while loop in the lock either. Right. Thread A stays in both. So thread A waits for thread B to exit the locks loop, which it's never going to do. So these two threads are, are really the, the two stooges in the deadlock here. They're precluding each other from, from executing. And this program just stalls. Yes, it actively stalls. I use the term stall probably inappropriately here. But that's what happens. So this locking implementation, number one, it's inefficient number two, because the, the, while, the threads that are, being, that are locked out are in this while loop, processor, which messes with processor scheduling and context switching. The other thing is that we have deadlock for more than one thread per block. But since these, this locking mechanism may still be useful, though, because a lot of times, I mean, you're gonna mostly you're gonna be executing far more blocks than threads per block, and in some cases, you'll only want to use one thread in a block for something in desperate situations like this, and um, this lock may still be useful. But be careful; 
if you're using this lock implementation, and really, probably any other lock implementation, you want to only use one thread per block because warps are going to get in the way and cause deadlock for this reason. If you got that lucky, yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Yeah, so if you, which, which would make this hard to diagnose. I mean, if you have, if you run the, the kernel for a really, really long time in parallel before this happens, then your threads may be spread out in enough in time that this error, this deadlock may go silent, which would be, you know, unfortuitous because then you would have an error in your code, but it would produce the correct answer anyway. That's why this stuff is so hard to diagnose, these race conditions and stuff. One of the toughest bugs that I know of to debug is, are in this area. So, yeah. Moral of stories, beware. Here's what I talked about today. So I got this locking implementation directly from this book, CUDA by example. I didn't make it up. They had it here. Um, so there, the inefficiency of the blocking of the locking mechanism um, was, in this case, not generated from my own naivete, but it, it could have been. Anyway, this is another good book. Here's the code from today on race conditions, how I fixed it, block counter at CU. There's also code online about the dot product that we talk and talked about last time, but using atomics to do it, and with locks and the built-in atomic functions. And as always, the slides and code are available here. Thank you for coming, and I'll see you next time. Sorry, I went five minutes over again. <laughs>